Hi, I was originally planning to do a video on the VR4300. However, as I was working on it, I realized that it is worth a series on its own. I also realized that there are some brief miscellaneous topics I'd like to cover before diving into the VR4300. To start off with, let's do a brief overview of logic symbols for digital circuits. These are important to know and recognize when looking at implementation diagrams and circuits for different components. We have the primitive logic component gates, AND, NAND, OR, NOR, NOT, XOR, and XNOR. These are all binary operations taking two inputs and producing a single output, with the exception of the NOT gate, which is unary and only takes one input. All of the gates on the top row can be expanded to take more than two inputs. An example of where you would want to do that is with a zero test. To see if a number is zero, you can simply pass each bit in parallel through a NOR gate, so an 8-bit number would have an 8-input NOR gate, resulting in a 1 if all of the bits are 0, and a 0 if any of the bits are 1. Next we have the more complicated block components, each of which is made up of the more basic logical gates. First we have the ALU, or adder. This unit is responsible for taking two multi-bit numbers and producing a single output. For example, an 8-bit adder will add two 8-bit numbers together and output the resulting 8-bit number. These can be represented by either of the two symbols, with the ALU usually taking the first symbol and the adder taking the second. The difference between an ALU and an adder is that an ALU is also responsible for performing bitwise logical operations such as AND and NOR. Next we have a shifter. This unit is responsible for taking a multi-bit input and shifting it either left or right. Shift operations are used in many computations, the most obvious being multiply and divide by 2, being a left shift by 1 and a right shift by 1, respectively. Another useful component is that of the multiplexer or MUX. This component allows a circuit to select one of multiple inputs. Typically, MUXs have a power of two inputs due to the way that they are implemented internally and how the value is selected. For a two-input MUX, you would only need a single bit to select one of the two inputs. For a 4-input MUX, you would need 2 bits to select one of the inputs. A 3-input MUX would also require 2 bits, and therefore would be equivalent to either chaining two 2-input two MUXs, or using a 4-input MUX with two inputs wired together. The previously mentioned units are all combinational logic, meaning that they are not controlled by a global clock. Most logical implementations use a clock to temporarily store results and make sure results occur at regular intervals. The most typical component for doing this is that of the register. Here, a multi-bit number is stored for a clock cycle, providing a stable output for any combinational logic that follows. Most registers have additional functionality, such as a write or enable flag, which allow the register to retain a value for multiple clock cycles, as well as a clear or set flag for setting the register contents to 0 or 1. And finally, let's briefly discuss clock polarity on components. Here the clock input is represented with the triangle symbol, and will either have an inverting circle or no inverting circle. Typically clock components without an inverting circle are latched at the rising edge of the clock, where the inverted clock components are on the falling edge. This can be done because the clock is typically a very consistent square wave, where each clock cycle, the clock must rise and then fall. Using clock polarity is a way to achieve a higher clock speed in a pipeline without increasing the global clock frequency. This is used a few places in the VR4300 processor, which you will see in another video. Now that we have covered a few components, note that most of them have controlling input signals, such as the MUX selection, the shift amount and direction, the ALU operation, and the register write and clear signals. You should be asking yourself, how are these control signals typically generated? The simple answer is by using combinational logic like the primitive gates, but that can be challenging to design, so the more complicated but easier to implement answer is a finite state machine. Finite state machines, or FSMs, are clocked devices with a clearly defined internal state and clearly defined transitions based on the inputs. Here is a simple example from Wikipedia, which I happen to think illustrate FSMs quite well. The example is that of a turnstile typically used to enter a subway or metro system in a city. We have two states here, locked, where the turnstile will not rotate, and unlocked, where it will rotate. The turnstile will be in one of these two states. The default or initial state is shown via a black dot in this case being the lock state. Now, the turnstile allows for two types of inputs, adding a coin or pushing on the turnstile. If the turnstile is in the locked state, pushing on the turnstile will result in it not turning, and will keep it in the locked state. This is until a coin is added, and then transitions to the unlocked state. 
Here, adding another coin will keep it in the unlocked state, and pushing on it, i.e. walking through the turnstile, will transition it back to the locked state. Looking at this diagram, you may wonder where the clock comes into play. Well, registers are usually responsible for holding the current state, which allow for transitions only at clock intervals. This prevents spurious logic flipping from complicated transition conditions, sending the machine into an incorrect state. The above example is an example of a more type state machine, where the outputs, i.e. the turnstile being allowed to rotate, only depends on the current state. This is in contrast to a merely type state machine, where the outputs depend on the state and the inputs. This would be where the turnstile would be allowed to turn once the coin is inserted, but before it enters the unlocked state. The difference is not as obvious in this example, however it often leads to more erratic output behavior, with the benefit of the outputs being able to respond faster than a single clock cycle. Out of the two though, more type state machines are used more often, mostly because they are easier to write and they are safer, where the clock can be used to guard the outputs. Additionally, in some applications, if the output is not a direct result of the state, i.e. the signal being encoded in the state, an additional register may be used to clock the output signal before it is sent to the rest of the system. Such state machines are used in cases where spurious logic signals can cause serious problems to the system's operation. Examples of such systems can be found in aircraft, military defense, such as missiles, and medical equipment. Now let's talk about DMA controllers, which have been mentioned in previous videos. These are also examples of finite state machines, and are a bit more complicated than the turnstile example. Here, a DMA controller is a device that sits on the memory bus, or system bus, and copies data from address A to address B. An example of this would be loading a texture into a GPU. To do this, you would specify where in main memory the texture is stored, and where to store the texture, where being the address of the GPU's internal memory, and how big the transfer, i.e. image, is. This would be set up through writes to the memory mapped registers of the DMA controller by a CPU. The CPU would then tell it to start and continue working on something else while the DMA controller copied the memory in the background. How would we implement this? To start off with, let's define a few input registers. We have address A, address B, the transfer size, and a status register. The status register would contain things like if the DMA controller is busy, i.e. currently copying data, and can also represent the go command, usually done via writing a 1 to the status register. Now let's assume the DMA controller has some internal memory to temporarily store the result, since system buses typically require components on them to either source or sync data and not direct the flow of it. We would also need a temporary count register to hold how many words have currently been transferred. Now let's declare a few states. We have an idle state where the DMA controller is doing nothing, a read state where it is reading from address A, and a write state where it is writing to address B. Notice the default case is idle, where it wouldn't make much sense for the controller to be reading or writing when no command has been issued to it yet. Additionally, the address in the read and write states correspond to the bus address, being address A plus count and address B plus count, respectively. With the states out of the way, we can now work on the transitions. We have the default case in idle, where no go command is issued. Next we have the transition to reading when the go command is issued. This transition also sets the temporary count variable to zero. Now buses typically have a signal to specify if the result on the bus is valid, so we will check for that, and we can transition to the write state if the read value is valid. I am using a form of UML here to specify the state diagram, where conditions are represented with plain text, and the transition effect is represented in square brackets. So in the idle to reset transition, the condition is go equals 1, and the effect is that the count is set to 0. In addition to the valid signal, buses typically also have an acknowledge or act signal, which means that the target device on the bus received the value. We can check for that and go back to read if we have an act. Since we just finished a single read-write transaction, we can then also increment the count variable by 1. Finally, we need a way to go back to idle, which is done when the count variable is equal to the size. We can do this in the read state, since we have the correct value for count when we enter the state. We also need to add a condition in the transition back to read and back to write, which makes sure that the transition to idle takes priority. Here the comma between conditions represents a logical AND, where both conditions must be true. And there we have it, a simple DMA controller state diagram. I'm not going to get into how to exactly implement this in a hardware description language, such as VHDL or Verilog. However, I can say that it is fairly trivial to write such a state machine from a diagram to other language.
Keep in mind that FSMs will appear in almost everything and are not only exclusive to DMA controllers and turnstiles. They are used to sequence RAM read and write signals, to set up various components such as Ethernet Max and audio codecs, and more importantly, they are used to set the control signals for CPUs. With that said, let's briefly discuss the two main computer architecture models before diving into the VR4300. Two main computer architecture models are reduced instruction set computers and complex instruction set computers, or RISC and CISC, respectively. The standard CPU model is shown above, where the CPU contains a set of registers, an arithmetic logic unit, or ALU, and access to an external memory source. The registers are a small portion of very fast memory, which can be accessed during a single CPU cycle. The ALU is the part of the CPU which does the computing. It performs arithmetic operations, such as add and subtract, as well as logical operations, such as AND, OR, XOR, and it performs left and right shifts. Notice how the loop drawn is closed, going from the register file to the ALU and back to the register file. This loop is called the data path and represents the flow of data in the CPU. As a side note, the bit depth of the CPU, i.e. 8, 16, 32, or 64 bit, is the width of this data path. Even though most CPUs have this internal structure, only the RISC architecture model fully exposes it. Exposing the internal structure to the programmer means the programmer must focus more on the hardware, allowing for them to optimize code using low-level instructions. The majority of these instructions act on the registers, with the only memory instructions being load and store. A few notable examples of RISC architecture are ARM, MIPS, and PowerPC. In contrast to RISC, the CISC model abstracts the internal structure of the processor away via more complex instructions. This means that the programmer does not have access to the low-level hardware and must rely on the CPU manufacturer's implementation of the provided instructions. The majority of these instructions act on memory instead of registers, many of which allow the programmer to specify a memory source, an operation, and a memory destination for the result. For example, you could load memory from address A and B, add the two values, and store the result back into address C, all in a single instruction. Within the processor, however, many simpler instructions are being executed, called micro-operations or micro-ops, such as in the previous example, two loads, an add, and finally a store. This is why CISC instructions often require multiple cycles to complete, whereas most RISC instructions only require a single cycle. Some notable examples of CISC architectures are the Intel 8086, which defined the x86 instruction set architecture, the Motorola 6800, and the Zilog Z80. One of the benefits that CISC has over RISC is that the instructions are often variable length, allowing programs to be smaller in size. In contrast, RISC architectures use fixed size instructions, usually 32 bits in length, leading to a larger program size. Since most processors have an internal RISC style structure, they are the main focus of computer architecture courses at universities, primarily focusing on the MIPS instruction set architecture. In the end, a CISC processor is essentially a variable length instruction interpreter standing between the programmer and a RISC style processor. Note that these models describe how the software, and therefore programmer, sees the CPU. The VR4300 is a five-stage pipelined RISC processor which implements the MIPS3 instruction set architecture. Let's start off by describing the general structure of MIPS. From the previous slide, recall that MIPS is a RISC instruction set architecture, meaning that it deals with register computations, and that such instruction set architectures usually use fixed length instructions. MIPS defines a 32-bit instruction that can come in one of three types. The first one is immediate instructions, which make use of a value encoded in the instruction itself. For example, incrementing a variable by 4. This would be done with an add immediate instruction, where the value 4 is encoded in the immediate field, and the location in the register file to increment is specified by the RS field. The result is then placed back into the register specified by the RT field. Note that conditional branches also fall into this category, where the immediate field represents the instruction address offset to branch to. Then there's the jump type instructions, which specify an unconditional jump location. There are only a few J-type instructions in the MIPS ISA, but some of them specify things such as placing the next instruction address into the register file, which is useful for function calls, or more specifically, returning from function calls. And finally, there is a register type instruction, which specifies an operation to be performed on two registers. The source registers are specified by the RS and RT fields, and the result location is specified by the RD field. The additional fields of the R-type instruction are the shift amount for statically defined shifts and a special function code for certain operations. The MIPS3 ISA specifies the following structure for the processor. First, there is the CPU, which can execute either 32-bit or 64-bit operations. 
The CPU has 32 general purpose registers and three special purpose registers, being the program counter or instruction address and the 128-bit wide high-low register used for the result of multiplication and division. Attached to the CPU is Coprocessor 0, which is the system control coprocessor, which is responsible for handling exceptions and interrupts, as well as dealing with memory management for virtual memory and permissions. This processor also has 32 special purpose registers, which can be accessed via the CPU. These are accessed through the general purpose move to and move from instructions. Additionally, the MIPS-3 ISA specifies a second coprocessor designated coprocessor 1, which is the floating point coprocessor. This coprocessor contains 32 floating point registers, as well as 32 control registers, which can be accessed via the CPU. The CPU cannot directly access the floating point registers for use in non-coprocessor 1 instructions, such as an add, and instead needs to copy or move the value from the floating point registers to the general purpose registers. Note that in both CP0 and CP1 cases, the control registers are not all used. For CP1, only register 0 and 31 are used. The last thing to note is a quirk in the MIPS instruction set architecture, which is that of the delay slot. This was added with pipeline processors in mind, where most processors require a one cycle delay to change the address to the next instruction after a jump or branch. This resulted in a delay slot being placed after every jump or branch instruction. This represents an instruction that is always executed, regardless of the result of the branch test. Usually, compilers will choose to place a useful instruction in this slot, which was originally to be executed before the branch, but whose result is not required for the branch or jump. If no instruction can be found, then the slot is filled with a NOP, or no operation, instruction. Now let's take a look at the operation decoding of the MIPS-3 instruction set architecture. For now, let's focus on the integer CPU instructions. Let's start off with the standard opcodes. The only important thing to take note of in the key is that any spot marked with an asterisk or Greek lowercase gamma are unimplemented or reserved instructions. So how do we read this table? If you recall from the previous slide, instructions have a 6-bit operand code in bits 31 to 26. Here the table splits the two groups of 3 bits, with the upper 3 bits going vertically and the lower 3 bits going horizontally, so each grid represents a unique 6-bit code. Let's take a look at the instructions here. We have two jump instructions, which will be the J type. The JAL instruction saves the next instruction address in the general purpose register number 31. We have eight 32-bit immediate type instructions representing addition, comparison, logical operations, and loading an immediate value. We have two 64-bit immediate type instructions, both of which being adds. We have eight conditional branch instructions. Here the L represents likely instructions, which is a way of telling the processor that the branch is likely to be taken. Eleven coprocessor instructions, which allow specific coprocessor instructions to be encoded as well as loading and storing values to coprocessor 1 and coprocessor 2. Note that coprocessor 2 is not defined in the MIPS-3 instruction set, but it can be implemented in specific cases. For example, the N64 Reality Signal Processor implements its vector processing unit as coprocessor 2. And finally, we have three special types of instructions. The top two will be discussed next, the third being a cache operation for dealing with the processor's cache. The rest of the instructions are either load from memory instructions, store to memory instructions, or are unimplemented. Now let's look at the special instruction code, which is used for all of the register type instructions. Note that these instructions are encoded in the functional field of the R type instruction. Here we have two or more jump instructions. In this case, they jump to an address stored in a register. 24 32 bit ALU instructions to do shifts, additions, subtractions, logical operations, comparisons, multiplication, and division. 17 64-bit ALU instructions, which do the same thing as their 32-bit counterparts. One special instruction, which generates a software interrupt, allowing for programs to send requests to an operating system. And the rest are either unimplemented or debugging instructions. Note that a division by zero exception is usually implemented using a trap instruction, which falls under the category of a debug instruction. Now we have the register immediate instructions, which take on the second special category of the general opcodes. This consists of eight branch instructions, all of which are comparisons with zero, and more debugging or unimplemented instructions. And finally, we have the general coprocessor instructions. We have 16 spots reserved for coprocessor specific instructions, one conditional branch instruction for a coprocessor condition signal, four general purpose move instructions to move values from and to the general purpose registers into the coprocessor, and two special move instructions to move values from the general purpose registers into the coprocessor control registers. The rest are unimplemented. That may seem like a lot of instructions, but wait, that's only the integer part of the instruction set. 
Luckily, coprocessor 0 has a simpler set of instructions. Here we have four conditional branch instructions, which apply to all coprocessors, not just coprocessor 0. These follow the branch encodings from the previous slide. Four TLB or translation leukocyte buffer instructions, which are used for setting up the TLB for virtual memory address translations and a single jump instruction, which is how the processor exits from an exception handling routine. The rest of the instructions are unimplemented. And last but not least, we have the coprocessor 1 instructions. First, we have the standard coprocessor instructions as previously seen. Next, we have specially formatted instructions for floating point operations. These are used in floating point R-type instruction encoding. There are four types of formats that can be used. Single precision, which is 32 bits, double precision, which is 64 bits, fixed word, which is 32 bits, and long word, which is 64 bits. Note that the long word can only be used when the processor is in 64-bit mode. However, double precision can always be used. These four encodings go into the format or FMT field. We then have two source registers, FT and FS, and a destination register, FD. These are analogous to the RT, RS, and RD registers respectively, with the exception that they correspond to the floating point registers and not general purpose ones. Finally, there is the function code. These include six normal ALU instructions, being add, subtract, multiply, divide, and negate, two special ALU instructions, being square root and absolute value, 16 comparison instructions, four conversion instructions, and eight truncation or rounding instructions. The rest are all unimplemented. Note that all of the instructions, with the exception of the conversion ones, can only be used on single and double precision numbers. That means that the only applicable instructions for fixed point instructions are the conversion, the single, or double. So that may seem like a lot of instructions, and it is. Keep in mind that all of these instructions must be implemented for an N64 emulator to properly emulate the behavior of the original N64 CPU. On the bright side, there are significantly fewer instructions to implement than in the x86 instruction set used by the Xbox. Additionally, the R5000 processor used by the PS2 added very few additional instructions, and the R3000 used by the PS1 used a subset of these instructions. That means that a VR4300 would be able to execute code from the PS1, with the exception of operations involving the Geometry Transformation Engine coprocessor. Finally, let's take a look at the overall VR4300 block diagram. Notice that the coprocessor 0 is connected to both caches, since it is responsible for address translations. Additionally, notice that there is only one 64-bit execution unit shown, as opposed to a 64-bit execution unit and a coprocessor 1 block. This is because both the integer execution unit and the floating point unit are unified into one component. This is done through a unified register file, which effectively is composed of 64 64-bit registers. Additionally, since the two are combined, the control registers for coprocessor 1 are added to the special register list for the CPU. Here I split the diagram into two lines to save space. Notice how only FCR0 and FCR31 are shown. The rest of the control registers are unimplemented. And finally, we have the coprocessor 0 structure. In this diagram, there's the TLB and all of the control registers. Note that these control registers are actually accessed via the move from to commands and not the control word commands. Out of all these registers, we have the TLB control registers, the cache and memory control and status registers, the exception handling registers, special storage registers for the operating system, and two read-only registers for the processor ID and system status. If this all seems overwhelming, you're not alone. And keep in mind, this is a processor from 1993, where newer ones are orders of magnitude more complicated. On top of that, this was only a high-level overview of the VR4300. On that note, in the next video, I will cover the VR4300 data path and pipeline. For a quick spoiler, the pipeline is not as simple as the MIPS Technologies datasheet and original patent make it seem. Thanks for watching.